So today I'm making salmon miso yaki, which translates to miso grilled salmon in Japanese. It's a staple in my house, and it's a super simple, delicious way to prepare salmon fillets at home. I'm gonna show you how to select, prepare, and cook this dish like we do at the restaurants. What's happening, guys? I am Jet Tila, and this is Ready Jet Cook, where I show you how to make some of my favorite Asian dishes from pantry to plate. Let's do this. Japanese, there it is, perfect. So for miso yaki, I'm gonna need mirin, sake, and ginger. Sake and mirin are actually cousins. Mirin is made from sake. Both have alcohol, both brewed from rice, but mirin has sugar in it, so it makes it sweet. So when I think about flavor profiles, you wanna use mirin to sweeten dishes, you wanna use sake to give that kind of burnt rice aroma. Fun fact, in Japan, the word sake just means all alcohol, all booze, beer, wine, etc. So if you want to look like a pro, sake is called nihonshu in Japanese. And then finally, we're gonna need some ginger for this misoyaki. When picking ginger, look for very large hands of ginger instead of small nubs like this, and make sure the ginger is bright yellow to pale yellow. As the ginger ages out, it starts to turn kind of blue, and you don't want that stuff. You know what, it wouldn't hurt to snap a little finger off just to check, and there you have it. So the last thing I need is miso paste. Now, there are several types. This is shiro miso, which is white miso. So it goes from white, yellow to red. The deeper you get, the saltier, the more earthy, the more umami you get. It's basically fermented soybean paste. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot more flavor though, right? The fermentation creates a lot of umami, that, that delicious savory note. So just think about this like a soy sauce paste, but it's so much more because there's a lot of layers. It's a really balanced flavor profile. Let's get cooking. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is actually make the miso yaki glaze. But this dish is a twofer because you're also gonna learn how to perfectly grill and season salmon. So the first thing we need to do is actually start the glaze by cooking down some sake and mirin. And the way I'm gonna do that very carefully is to preheat whatever vessel. This is a saucepan, but you can go bigger. Now it's very important, okay, that you're actually gonna pour the sake away from you. Uh, I want you to preheat your pan or your saucepan to get it like ripping hot. And very important, if you're cooking in a kitchen that has a low kind of hood space, you can actually just bring it up to a boil from cold. Don't try to flambe if you don't have a lot of hood space. So here we go. Hold your bottle thusly away from you and I'm just gonna pour away from myself and there it is. So what you're looking for is for the flames basically to ignite and then go away. And that means the alcohol in this sake is cooked down. So the next ingredient is gonna be mirin. It also has alcohol but a lot lower by volume. This is gonna give us the sweetness. So mirin, similarly to sake, is an alcohol made of rice. In America, we call these two things rice wine, which is kind of a misnomer in my opinion, because right, wine is made from fermenting of juices. Now these are grains, right? So rice fermentation is a grain. So in my opinion, these are more similar to beer. I'm gonna stick to that one because I think I'm right. So sake is cooked off, the mirin is boiling. Again, the pot is ripping hot, so do be careful. But you can actually see the sake is reduced almost all the way, like 75%. The mirin has also reduced. All those aromatic flavor notes are concentrated. It's time now to add sugar. So it's very important to dissolve this sugar 100%. The sugar is gonna do a few things, other than obviously being the sweet in here, it's also gonna give you that kind of syrupy glaze, right? It's gonna marry amazingly with the miso and give you this clingy, delicious glaze. Another thing I'm looking for is that pale yellow look of a reduced sake, which I'm getting now. At this point, I wanna reduce the flame because with all the sugar and the actual thickness of the syrup, it's gonna boil over quickly. So it's miso time. And you know, like I stated, I'm using a yellow miso here because it's the mildest of all three misos. And I'm gonna work that right in. If you've never tasted miso paste by itself, it's not as sharp as soy sauce, right? It doesn't have that deep saltiness of soy sauce. It's got a lot of savoriness to it, almost a sweet floral quality to it. It's a phenomenal ingredient anywhere you're looking for just a little bit of salt and a lot of savoriness. 
There we go. So as the miso is working in, I'm gonna turn up the heat just a little bit. And my job here now is just to make sure I whisk this in so it incorporates completely smooth into this sauce. All right, so the miso is incorporated perfectly. The sugar has dissolved. That is becoming one beautiful glaze. So I'm gonna turn this to low and I'm gonna show you a phenomenal ginger trick. It's kind of one of those ingredients that makes people go, why is this so delicious? Yes, I could use a planer, I could chop ginger, but I'm gonna show you a way to get just the pure ginger pulp without any skin or fibers. Check this out. Common box grater, you want the smooth, small holes. I'm gonna take a piece of cling film and just stretch it over. You don't have to wrap the entire box grater. Now take the actual ginger. We're gonna break off one finger. Uh, don't worry about peeling. All the magic will happen right here. And the goal here is to get straight ginger pulp, right? I want all the deliciousness of ginger melting into this sauce without grabbing any of the fibers. So just a, I would say light to medium pressure as you go back and forth. And then watch what happens, check that out. All of the fibers and the skin ends up there. And what you get concentrated on your grater is 100% pure ginger pulp, just like that. Great for sashimi, phenomenal for this dish. So I'm gonna get this into the pot. I wanna get the ginger in and make this a beautiful kind of glaze. Again, what am I looking for? I'm looking for one kind of perfect consistency, viscosity that'll coat the fish really well. And this is my chance to actually taste it because the sauce is practically done. Mm. The saltiness and the savoriness comes from the miso. The sugar really kind of supports it, and that ginger just pops perfectly. So if you're not gonna use this miso sauce right away, just put it in the fridge in an airtight container, and it is good for weeks. So, sauce is done. Let's focus on fish. The issue is this salmon filet is kind of a rectangle. It's kind of a pros versus Joe's situation. When you take a rectangular piece of fish, you just cut a block off of it and put it on the grill. It doesn't look super cool. I'm gonna show you how chefs deal with this rectangular piece of salmon and make it look like, you know, a piece of art culinaire. Watch this. All right, so first thing I'm gonna look for, this is skin on. We don't need the skin, but I like to leave it on because it keeps the moisture and the fat in. And what I'm gonna do, instead of just cutting a perpendicular block off the right here, watch what I do. I'm gonna take my knife, angle it 45 degrees, start in a little in from the left edge, and watch what happens. Use that blade and let it do the slicing for you. You know what, you eat with your eyes first, so I think it's really important to have food that looks cool. So I'm gonna cut my third piece off the fish now. Perfect, now I'm making sure to disconnect the actual skin. Now that first piece there, in a restaurant I would totally use that because I have one side that's sloped and the other side that's flat. Let's save these for later and focus on our three slices. So whenever I'm buying salmon, a few things that I'm looking for, right? I'll let your senses be your guide, okay? So visually first, I'm looking for really nice bright orange. I'm also looking for a translucent. It's like it should look wet, right? But not slimy, there's a big difference there. And then if you are at a piece of salmon you can actually get into, you wanna to touch it. I know, it makes uh, fishmongers crazy, but I mean, don't bruise the salmon, but you wanna push it down gently and it should bounce back. The third sense that I rely on is my smell. So if you're close enough to the salmon, it should smell sweet like the ocean. So those are the three quick tips on how to pick salmon. Fancy salmon cuts are down, and this is actually called karimi in Japanese, yes. Like French have knife cuts for everything, so do the Japanese. So off angle is called karimi, which is what I've done here. And I'm simply just gonna season with salt and pepper on both sides. One side is totally seasoned. Let's go to the other. I'm using kosher salt, just in case you're wondering. I do like a coarse kosher salt or a flake sea salt. So the seasoning is adhered. Let's talk about the grill. So I'm using a grill pan, right? Few critical steps that ensure really great grilling without sticking. Preheating is number one. And number two is make sure that grill has been cleaned from that last use, which this one obviously has. And I'm relying on that seasoning of the grill, which I can see that this grill has been used, it's been cleaned right. So it's built up a very natural nonstick surface, which is called seasoning. And what you can do to guarantee less stick is to pre-oil the salmon. I'm gonna show you how I like to do it. You know, my buddy Tad and Allie, they give me a hard time because, you know, I like using pan spray. So what I like to do is I'll take the seasoned salmon and I hit it with a little bit of spray oil. And you know what, I use the canola because I think it has a better smoke point, has a higher temperature. And I'll do both sides before I lay it on there. 
I think spray oil is the best thing since sliced bread because it's a controlled spray. It doesn't get goopy. It gives you that perfect mist for what we got to do here. This is a grill pan, obviously, so not the kind of grill that has the flame shooting through. What I do is put my hand about two inches above, and if I can't hold my hand there for about four to five seconds, then I'm good. Another thing I'm looking for is a little smoke, and I've got both of those things right here. Grill is at the perfect temperature. My fish is oiled and seasoned. So what I'm looking for are for those kind of raised areas, and I'm gonna go down and away from me. One, two, and three. There we go. So important. Don't mess with the grill, friends. Let the grill do its thing. You're getting heat from the bottom. The bottom of this fish needs to sear, almost needs to cauterize, get those grill marks in. What you can do is use your eyeballs. Again, lean on your senses. What I'm looking for is a color change from orange to kind of that grilled brown color. And that's gonna be the first indicator to see when it lifts up. And another thing is there's only one presentation side on food. So I wanna nail a beautiful grill mark on one side and you got two chances for this. If you don't get it here, you can get it on the other side. But I'm not always focused on fish having to be cooked 50% and 50% top and bottom. I wanna nail that grill mark on one side and then I wanna get that temperature kind of medium to where just the salmon starts flaking apart. Because I've let that fish basically sear on the bottom, I can get in and it's not sticking and I'm not getting a big oil slick on the bottom of the fish. And I like these grill spatulas a lot. I think they're the perfect thing because they're flexible and they get in. So watch, pull back, over, perfectly grilled salmon every single time. Boom. It's that simple, friends. I love this dish for a few reasons. When I was in my 20s and I was going to sushi school, part of the rituals of working in a restaurant is everyone takes a turn cooking family meal every week, all right? So although we were working on sushi for 12, 15 hours a day, I would look forward to family meal. There was one chef that I worked with who made this salmon misoyaki, which is a very home style dish. And like, I fell in love with it. We were playing with all these exotic ingredients, but you know what, the highlight of my week was when chef would make salmon misoyaki. So I stole that from him and he stole that from his grandmother and I'm giving it to you now. So this is why I love this dish so much. So the way to check doneness is unscientific. It's a little more art than anything. I'm pressing down in the middle and it should just give, right? It shouldn't push down and it shouldn't be so firm and rock hard, which is telling me that this fish is just cooked through. And again, I'm going in with a fish spatula to wiggle it first. And if it wants to come up, it is done. So let's land these so we don't overcook them. That is perfect. And in case you were wondering why I didn't do four pieces, four is a bad luck number in a lot of Asian countries. Uh, look it up, it's a cool little fun fact. So it's time to put it all together. I'm going with brown rice, but any grain will work here. If you're kind of going grainless, cauliflower rice or zoodles would even be really cool. So boom, a little kind of one side versus the other there. And then I'm gonna land my fish kind of over like it's swimming. It's kind of that art of plating. Let me plate this this way on the plate. I'm gonna turn it towards you. And I just need to simply sauce this. What you wanna do, if the sauce has been hanging out for a little bit, guys, make sure you get a little stir on there. And if it's tightened up a little too much, add a little water or a mirin, either one works. And I'm gonna kinda of just go right over the top and then over around the plate. Another thing you could do if you really like that kind of lacquering or that big time saucing, is take a nice brush and get the brush in there and really kind of laminate that sauce in there. Oh man, that looks delicious. So important to get enough sauce for every bite of rice is what I like to do. And then for simple garnishes, I love sesame seeds. I think that looks beautiful. And then um, I always cut some scallions on the bias and just make a little bit of garnish there and on this side. That's amazing. That is salmon misoyaki. Last thing left to do, I mean, you know the last Tila rule of cooking is to taste your food. The perfect bite, in my opinion, is a good piece of salmon, smother that rice with sauce, and you gotta get a decent amount of scallion. I'm gonna crush that. Mm. I mean, that dish hits on so many happy levels. You've got kind of that delicious salmon taste. You got the sweetness from the sugar. You got that mirin, you got the miso that kind of ties it all together with savoriness. This is my idea of a perfect meal. So there you have it, friends, a homemade salmon miso yaki with, you know, grandma's sauce that we stole from my other chef, but now it's yours. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. We'll see you guys next time on Ready, Jet, Cook.